Could you please take your seats? Thank you. Welcome uh, to this public opening of the Information Influx Conference, celebrating the 25th anniversary of IVIR, Institute for Informatierecht, Institute for Information Law. My name is Bernd Jugendholz. I'm one of the directors of the Institute. I'm very excited, as I hope many of you are, about our conference, which will continue until Friday afternoon in the Rode Hood. And that's not here, that's elsewhere in Amsterdam, as you hopefully have discovered. Um, we already have over 200 registered participants, but there actually still is room for one or two more. Some late arrivals can still register. I actually have some folders with me. Um, as most of you know, IVIR, the Institute for Information Law, is a research center of the University of Amsterdam Faculty of Law. Officially founded in 1989, the Institute has grown gradually into the largest research center in this field in Europe. I would, of course, love to tell you much more about the exploits of our institute, but time does not allow me to do so, and this is not what you came for anyway today. It is my pleasure to uh, present this wonderful opening event this afternoon, and I would like to now ask Professor Louise Gunning, President of the Executive Board of the University of Amsterdam, to open the conference. Thereafter, I invite Professor Edgar Dupiron, Dean of the Law Faculty, to say a few words of welcome. Professor Gunning. Thank you very much, Bernd, and welcome, all of you. Welcome to Amsterdam. Welcome to the University of Amsterdam. We're delighted that you found time to come to our birthday party. This is the 25th anniversary of IVER, and you weren't allowed to say a lot about the Institute, which I think is the right way of uh, placing us. I can say it. It's one of our cherished and very excellent research institutes. We're very proud of it. We're proud of the fact that Bernd and Nico at the start chose to put information central rather than information technology. And when Bernd explained to me what had happened over these 25 years, coming from the medical field, I felt it was a little bit like the evolution of law in relation to a changing environment. And I thought, well, that fits into the core of what I would think of as a research in a university. That's wonderful. But he also explained to me, and I think that the fact that you're all here seems to acknowledge that he was right, is that it is more than a research institute. It's a brand. It's a brand that is recognized around the world. And even maybe, but I learned afterwards that that's because I talked to Bernd and not to Nico, you could see it more as a football club. And you understand that we Dutch at the moment feel very strongly about our football club. And I think that there's no reason why that will change before the end of this conference on Friday night. So live with us with the image of Bernd and Nico as the coaches of a wonderful team that over 25 years has had wonderful results and that we as a university and as a country can be very, very proud of. So welcome to this birthday party. Celebrate this anniversary. Celebrate the excellence of the research that you will be presented here today. And I hope that there will be many, many more anniversaries to come. Ladies and gentlemen, I also welcome you to this birthday party. I feel very humble as a dean to speak after the president and before the very distinguished speakers which are on the program this afternoon. Um, so I promised Bern to, to keep it very brief, but it would, be, it would not be fitting to say nothing because that would not express the pride that we at the law school have in our Institute for Information Law, um, not only in their international research of which the president talked, but also, although they don't stress that too much in their teaching, but, and that's something I really wanted to stress, the excellent environment they offer to brilliant young 
researchers. The IFER is really, for young researchers, the place to be at our school, and I find it very, very stimulating. So I want to congratulate the staff and the coaches of the IFER on their achievements, but I also am very confident, because of this atmosphere the IFER offers, that there will be a very fruitful next 25 years, and I think that's the best way to begin a birthday, to think about the future. I compliment you, and I wish you a brilliant future. Thank you, Bert. Thank you very much, uh, Louise and Edgar, for these very kind words on behalf of all of either. Enough congratulations, however, for the moment. Um, let's turn to substance. If a uh, Nobel Prize would exist for the field of information law, and it should, <laughs> Professor Jochai Benkler would make a very strong candidate. He is the Berkman Professor of Entrepreneurial Legal Studies at Harvard Law School and co-director of the Berkman Center for Internet and Society at Harvard. And amongst many other accolades that I could exhaustively mention, but we have no time, he is the author of the influential book, a great book to read, The Wealth of Networks, which examines the ways in which information technology permits extensive forms of collaboration that have potentially transformative consequences for economy and society. Professor Benkler is also, I'm happy to say, an old friend of the Institute. In fact, a long time ago, in internet time, that is, in 2001, he visited the Institute, inspiring all of us with his original ideas, his broad knowledge of the field, sharing that knowledge with everyone he talked to, and he talked to everyone. And also, and I will never forget this, introducing us to this ultra cool new search engine that he had just discovered called Google. Those were the days. Professor Benkler, Jochai, we're extremely happy and proud that you have accepted our invitation to, live, to deliver the opening keynote for this conference, and I give you the floor. With that kind of introduction, uh, how can I fail but um, 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 disappoint? Um, it's nice to be at a birthday where you can say I've known you for more than half your life. I have known you for more than half your life institutionally. Uh, the, the, the time I spent here in 2001 was fascinating and engaging, and it really was a, a, a fantastic uh, set of conversations. Uh, and you have always been uh, our close conversation partners and the people with whom we really wanted always to talk here in Europe and learn from uh, over the years. And it's a tremendous honor and pleasure to be here uh, with you uh, to celebrate your birthday. Um, the other thing is not just you, but Amsterdam. 30 minutes of a walk on a sunny day in Amsterdam does more to explain the public-private distinction the spirit of collaboration in the Grachten and individuality in the quirky houses, of deep libertarianism that comes from having people smoke while riding a bike in a city that is completely covered with this sense of both collective responsibility and unique individuality and all that respect. Uh, uh, it's beautiful and it makes me smile and it's in that regard unique in the world and I'm happy to be here. I thought I'd start with things that are contemporary. Um, we could celebrate um, a fantastic player. We could celebrate a fantastic team. I fell in love with the Dutch team when Johan Cruyff was still running around uh, uh, at its head. Uh, we could celebrate fan culture and the way in which people take these images and make them their own and use popular culture, but that would be so last decade. Instead, I want to talk about things that raise angst, about things I'm worried about. I call this talk sketches 
because I don't know what I think yet, but I want to share some of the things that are raising angst for me, some of the reasons that are, for, that are causes for concern and for which I don't have answers but want to try to struggle with them with you as we go along. Whether we have this week's uh, Facebook uh, um, experiment story, which we'll talk about a bit, whether it's the rise of the so-called sharing economy, which is anything but, whether it's uh, uh, the outrage in the US about Comcast doing in terms of Wi-Fi, what SFR and Iliad have been doing for years in France, what BT is doing in Britain, or whether it's the ubiquitous NSA, anyone out there? Um, all of these raise new and somewhat different challenges than those that we talked about in the past. And I want to try to both identify the promise as we saw it 10 to 15 to 25 years ago, the gathering clouds, and to begin to sketch an outline of what a political theory might look like or what components of it might be there to try to explain how we approach ethically as individuals and politically as a polity a context in which imperfection seems to be everywhere. There is no perfecting of market. There is no perfecting of the state and democratic processes. There is no perfecting of individualist and, and, and decentralized mutualist collaboration. There is simply imperfection and failure everywhere, but it is only partial failure. And how do we think about the world in that context? So let me talk a little bit about the promise. <clears throat> In 2002, at a presentation I gave at the Center for the Public Domain, at, 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 uh, as Jamie and Jennifer are sitting here, um, I talked about two social aspects central to the emerging technological economic condition of the network information economy, non-market production and radically decentralized production, as alternative modes of production that allowed increased productivity through innovation and creativity that was unfettered by the past, while also improving the opportunities for autonomy, democracy, and social justice. And the battle about the future was won over the institutional ecology of whether or not the incumbents of the 20th century would succeed in setting up law in such a way as to prevent the emergence of these new uh, organizational models. The promise I suggested was that if we understand productivity as a limit in the way in which we can mix autonomy, democracy, and social justice, that limit is pushed out by new increases in productivity that allow for the embedment of a more social model of production. The drivers were partly technological, partly organizational, partly social, partly cultural, radically decentralized capabilities of general purpose computers, common carrier-like wire service, general standards-based platforms, standards-based browsing, mostly APIs, the emergence of free and open source software is creating core capabilities the ability of strong copyright-based industries to be pushed back on by a political and cultural movement or peer production and sharing and creation of decentralized culture and the emergence of commons-based uh, 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 practices that did not allow the person contributing to the shared culture experience to control it um, um, uh, became a feasible pathway for expression and innovation. A way of thinking about it is to say that in the first two-thirds of the 20th century, we saw concentration of functions in both market and non-market forms from decentralized families and markets to more centralized and rationalized bureaucracies following Weber, um, uh, etc. The Reagan-Thatcher revolution, the rise of the Washington Consensus, and the shift to privatization and, and, and expert-led privatization in the EU all pushed all of these domains into decentralized markets. And ultimately, what the networked information economy allowed is the shift to a, 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 a mix of social production as a newly effective modality that allowed, to some extent, to moderate the ills of markets and state and, and, um, uh, and firms while providing new modes of uh, production. Over the course of that first 10 to 15 years, what happened was the emergence from complete disbelief to shock and rejection to understanding social production as a solution space for a wide range of uh, problems. As, an, as a major organizational innovation for achieving outcomes in society across domains from pure innovation and consumer reviews, all the way to news, commentary, 
and political mobilization from municipal government services provisioning to uh, UN a High Commission on Refugee using people to scan satellite images and find refugees. The practices were first and foremost social, networked, collaborative, productive, meritocratic, perhaps autonomy respecting and perhaps virtuous in the sense that they allowed people to act through belief and practice and embed in their practices and habits a set of things that they understood to be right. The wrap up to the book talk that I gave on Wealth of Networks had this very ambitious statement. Technological threshold conditions enable greater individual human agency. Social sharing and exchange emerge as a major modality of economic production. We're beginning to practice new ways of being free and equal human beings subject to a global and persistent political and regulatory battle. And that was the core of the battle that so many people here in uh, uh, the room uh, were part of, was the effort to prevent the 20th century from implementing through law, be it copyright, be it telecommunications, DRM, uh, uh, or what or contract, embedding control systems and preventing the emergence of decentralized production. We saw that as something that needed to happen at all layers, from the physical layer of Wi-Fi versus owned proprietary, uh, through the logical layer at all of the levels of the software, and all the way to cultural production as Wikipedia becomes the main uh, knowledge model, so that as we live through these systems, we need an open and commons-based alternative at each as the way in which we negotiate uh, freedom. So what are the gathering clouds? At the core is the shift. It was never a technologically deterministic claim. At the core is the shift to a closed device, a device that runs on a network that's proprietary, using proprietary protocols, software that's proprietary, um, a, a device that may or may not be a, a, a trusted device based on whatever decisions. Some of these decisions were, in fact, subject to the debates that we were part of on the regulatory side. For example, the question of open spectrum versus proprietary spectrum and how much of each one. The question, the battle over whether to require trusted systems uh, or not in order for the device to actually work. Um, some of them were simply market battles of who moved first. One lesson was that whether we won the battles or we lost the battles, and we won critical battles, what ended up happening was adoption in the market of the brilliant device that Steve Jobs put together that was the antithesis of the open computation model that everything that we had looked at uh, had worked on. And predictably, you had uh, the mistakes, the trying to stop Skype from using, um, um, uh, uh, from using carriers as opposed to Wi-Fi, uh, the beautiful example of Apple removing from the App Store an application that was a game that was critical of their uh, employment uh, uh, practices uh, in China, all of the predictable stuff. The standard answer is market competition. And in fact, we saw Android developing as a basic uh, alternative. We saw situations, for example, when the WikiLeaks app for reading the cables was removed by Apple, you could still get it on Android. So market competition, to some extent, Android develops more in the market. But that only depends on you having some form of competitor who's actually committed to keeping openness, as opposed to simply having two versions of the same thing. We haven't yet got Mozilla OS. We'll see how that plays out and whether it gets adopted. Uh, you might also be happy if you agree. So for example, when this runs as an app on Android that identifies each company's position on Sopa Pippa, the statute that uh, there was so much debate over in the US, uh, you could be happy or you could be unhappy depending on whether you thought it was appropriate for a company to use its particular location to embed its positions in politics on markings with regard to a unit. The other possibility of getting away from this proprietary platform is the continued shifting to other technical frameworks. HTML is still available, whether it's for the Financial Times, if it doesn't want to pay Apple for the uh, App Store 30% fee and uses HTML5 to emulate an app without actually running it, or whether it's actually people going on the net. The majority of people who saw the WikiLeaks cable, it was on the net, not on any of these apps, so it didn't matter so much. But again, here, beyond the policy, there is actual market adoption. Convenience, habit, market adoption are critical vectors for change 
in the levels of, uh, uh, of, of openness. So if you have an overwhelming majority of people who use mobile, using apps, as you see up there, as opposed to the browser, then the fact that you can use the browser on a mobile doesn't mean that it's actually open, because that's not the actual habit of use. That becomes the critical constraint. Wi-Fi. We won that battle in the intellectual sense. The majority of people using, uh, this is old data, now the majority of use of data used over uh, mobile is in fact running over Wi-Fi, not over proprietary networks. This was a massive debate. As early as 96, Dave Beyer wrote about rooftop community networks and the possibility that people would connect their devices together and create an alternative network. I wrote about the fact that that could be the core infrastructure of first and last resort. As late as March of 2010, the US National Broadband Plan still said the solution is sell more spectrum. <clears throat> a mere two years later, the president's task force on spectrum policy said the essential element of the new federal spectrum architecture is that the norm for spectrum use should be sharing, not exclusivity. A radical intellectual shift. I would love to claim credit for us in the intellectual community who worked on that. But then there's reality. There's the fact that in real markets, like, uh, uh, like markets for, for smart grid communications, an overwhelming majority of actual deployed modes used unlicensed, not licensed, even though that was considered the most important growth area for cellular. Wireless healthcare, unlicensed, not licensed, even though that was the second major sector in which the cellular was supposed to come. Payment system, access control, inventory management, in all of these in the real market of actual innovation, unlicensed, un outperformed, uh, licensed exclusive until it changed policy. So we won, or did we? Because the thing that was most critical, the creation of an alternative platform that would not be owned by anyone and would not form a basis of control, failed. We have had 15 years now or more of people talking about community networks, about building ad hoc mesh networks as an infrastructure of first and last resort. And what have been the actual deployments? It's been this. It's been BT owned phone. BT and phone have teamed up and bring you more access to Wi-Fi. Lovely smiley colors. It's the Wi-Fi community, but it's actually just an extension using the technology of the same organizational model. The critical affordance of an unowned infrastructure turned into an owned infrastructure, not because of its technology, not because of its regulation, but because of its organizational structure, because we who talked about community Wi-Fi networks didn't build them before those guys got wise. So now we have Comcast coming out, and there's a fear, because it, open Wi-Fi has become just an extension of the hated Comcast. A caution. Our own limitations as a disorganized public to actually achieve what we want, even when we win the policy battle, even when we win the intellectual battle. Then we move to cloud services. A critical component of the change was radical decentralization of the capital organization of uh, computation, sensing, communications, and storage. But when you move to cloud services, that radical decentralization of capital gets inverted. You suddenly need the uh, ability to invest in uh, uh, the massive server farms of Google in order to actually compete. You can no longer be Google the way that it came when I was here and we were marveling at it uh, because you need the server farm. This becomes a point of control. And that point of control becomes for the first time what we see as the public-private partnership for social control between governments and much more centralized and controlling organizations. So when WikiLeaks comes out, the administration doesn't say anything, the FCC doesn't say anything, but Senator Lieberman comes out and says, you have to take off WikiLeaks, this is illegal, this is terrible, and in fact, Amazon does, it goes to France, the French minister does the same thing, it's off for a few days, and most dangerously and importantly, the idea of identifying centralized points of control that was so central to the battles over ISP liability in the 90s, that was so central at the time to the, to the Digital and Copyright Act and all of the battles then, gets reintroduced now through SOPA PIPA, through Street Strike, through ISP cooperation with these new points of control as a modality. The state says, you're bad. It doesn't necessarily even have to come up with a full legal explanation, and then you're off. But again, all is not lost. If you take the same WikiLeaks story, that strategy failed because of a counterculture and a counterpower of decentralized 
uh, resistance. You see the Swedish Pirate Party initially uh, backing up the data and making it available. You see all sorts of different places emerge. And you see reminiscence. Man, it's DC DCSS all over again. Who knows what DCSS is about and what the cultural reference is? Oh, yeah, yeah, we're going to have to tell long stories, but we won't. Uh, suffice it to say that it's like saying, remember the old wars from the ancient times? This is like that all over again, and we're having a culture war all over again from a different context to a different context. The point is a shared narrative from the cultural wars about copyright gets translated into shared mobilization of resistance on censorship. Then we have this monstrosity. Um, we're told about the sharing economy. We won, right? 10 years ago, it was insane to talk about the possibility of sharing as a central effective modality of production. When you said Wikipedia will succeed because of here's the argument, you were off the wall, trust me. And yet it moves. But as it moves, it creates a marketing opportunity. When you talk about Airbnb and couch surfing in the same breath, you are fundamentally creating an oppositional interpretation of what could have been an alternative way of understanding social exchange and turning it into simply a feel-good marketing plot. There's a fundamental difference between saying, use your assets of which you have excess capacity, the bedroom that you're not using, as a way to engage other people to travel and, and stay with others, this gift exchange, explicitly excluding monetary exchange, which is couch surfer. And Airbnb, which says, do I go to sleep at my mother's this weekend because I could rent it out for more? And every decision at the margin becomes a marginal decision, reintroducing the tyranny of the margin into everyday practiced experience. So we have a battle over what it means to share and that not all exchanges are sharing and money makes things different and marginal decisions of money are not social exchange decisions. But here we have it, an ideological battle over the meaning of what we do. And what was feasible and plausible to say a few years ago with regard to Amazon Mechanical Turk as being in the same category as Mars Click Workers or anything like that, fundamentally when you have a platform that allows for however many thousands of tens of thousands of Indian workers to work for substandard from Western perspective uh, uh, wages in Western uh, output putting out or people to do, then you're talking about alienated labor, not talking about actual uh, sharing and collaboration. So we need a much better understanding of what's really at stake and how it's working. So the threats to this point, appliancization, that is to say adoption of the handheld and embedded ubiquitous computing opaque to its users, reconcentration of capital, market emergence of closed systems and widespread adoption of these systems through passive consumption patterns, failure of open commons-based practices to capture the technical high ground for many of the core platforms of the information environment, and marketing embracing, extending, and subverting core emotional and ideological tropes, and making us miss this point as a new double movement, as a new moment in which the tyranny of the market can get constrained and located within social relations instead of outside them and subverting. So we said there's a new solution space. We need it now. There's fantastic new work really digging into a second generation that no longer needs to say, yes, this exists. Peer production exists. Social exchange exists. But rather, how does it work? Let's study very closely what the dynamics are, what the social dynamics are, what's the motivational structure of cooperation. It's really critical work. But I call to you who are young in this uh, uh, crowd, we also need a politically motivated and directed focus on finding how to provision collectively in a sharing mode these core critical infrastructure components that will reverse the trends to concentration and centralization. Then we come to this monstrosity. So the hot thing of the week, um, uh, Facebook uh, 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 researchers publish in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences that by sending, changing the news feed of Facebook users, they show um, uh, changes in mood. Set aside whether the scientific validity of the claim and the quality of what happened in the peer review there, although that's a lot of what people are talking about. What I want to play out for you is to what extent this very act, the idea that by changing the news feed of users, you can change their mood and affect, 
do for all of the claims about autonomy, about democracy, and about market efficiency, right? If you're in a nudge world where you can run experiments that predictably will move people's moods, preferences, policies, principles, employ them on a mass scale with experimentation and implementation in platforms, and predictably move people, what autonomy? What human being are we talking about? If you can predictably shape people's voting patterns, if you can predictably shape people's beliefs about the state of the world and the relations between cause and effect, and do so by running hundreds of thousands of experiments and then implementing, democracy shifts to micro-targeting. And what on earth are we talking about market efficiency? Veblen, over 100 years ago, wrote about um, 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 uh, conspicuous consumption and the theory of the leisure class as essentially marketing undermining the very concept of consumer uh, choice. And here we have it on steroids. So Zeynep Tufekci has a beautiful piece coming out in First Monday, um, um, uh, uh, now in July 2014, where she lays this out. Let me just sort of put a couple of, of highlights. Uh, the combination of ubiquitous computing, the set of uh, practices we call big data, comprehensive surveillance plus uh, uh, modeling and computation, the behavioral turn, I cannot emphasize enough on the intellectual side the importance of the behavioral turn and the understanding that if not quite Skinner, we can get to a point where we can predictably intervene in people's entire information in 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 environment to move their behavior. And we begin to see that in psychology, in economics, in political science, as a normal scientific practice. That is a Pandora's box that will not be put back in the box. And once the tool is there, it will be used because it's extremely lucrative and attractive. Real-time experimentation and implementation we talked about. Nudge. My colleague Cass Sunstein and the idea of nudge and the benevolence of nudge. Who wouldn't want to shape the environment in such a way that people save more for retirement, that people eat healthier choices? How could that be bad? It's just a choice. Afterwards, you can do whatever you want. The legitimation of the idea that it's okay as long as you leave people the ability to opt out, to refine exquisitely nudges that get them to behave in the way that you want them to behave is as fundamentally destructive as the idea of consumer sovereignty was to the problem of power in the market and understanding power in the market. So, by power, I mean the ability of one entity to alter the behaviors and configurations or outcomes of others, measured in terms of probabilities of deviation from baseline preferred behaviors, configurations, or outcomes. Technical details, if you want, um, um, in a piece called Networks of Power, Degrees of Freedom. Um, what I tried to do is I tried to take Hohfeld's theory of rights applied to law and boil it down into a question of power. And understanding that you can identify relations of power as power and susceptibility and no po freedom and no power. But what's critical is over here. The domains of application, and those are those that are extracted from Hohfeld's theory of law, is our behavior, you can apply to pre preferences, policies, and principles, the P's, the actions, the outcomes, and critically configurations. This is what Hohfeld describes as powers, liabilities, immunities, etc. So the idea that you can configure the systems that people inhabit, such as to influence the degree to which people have power and susceptibility to changes in their P's, their A's, and their O's. Um, that's the critical move that we're seeing here with Facebook. What we're seeing here is the construction of a system of predictable, testable, implementable power projection defined in this sense of one person affecting the P's, A's, and O's of another uh, person so that that person's behaviors align with that with the person with the power. That's the critical point to uh, see here. So what are the responses? Market competition. We said it can't happen. It's fundamentally flawed markets, strong network effects. But more fundamentally, what does it mean to have consumer choice when you can predictably test how people will behave and implement at the individual level? At the individual level. Social production. Well, we had diaspora trying to replace social networking. That didn't work out. Uh, we saw it with open wireless community networks. We have example of massive success, like Mozilla, like the LAMP stack, but we also have uh, um, uh, failures to strive, massively important. But maybe the state, maybe law and regulation. That brings us to two problems. One is ideological, the other is practical. 
The ideological one is, here's, for example, when we look for places where peer production has succeeded with decentralized production in a core capability, Kickstarter is a great example. But Kickstarter, so this is Stephen uh, uh, Johnson's example, the National Endowment of the Arts now provides less money from the art than uh, peer production, uh, th than peer uh, uh, crowd, uh, crowdfunding uh, through Kickstarter. That's a massive success. And in fact, we have artists who've made a lot of money. We have artists who have become really good at managing a relationship with fans so that they don't rely on the alienating relationship with the labels, but at the same time also don't have to be amateurs. They can be real professionals built on a relationship of gift exchange rather than on a relationship that is uh, uh, alienated. But then you come and Kickstarter across things like this. People in a neighborhood saying, let's raise the money to build a park here. And you say, wait, are we talking Proudhonian anarchism or mutualism and self-creation and self-banking? Or are we talking about George Bush the father's thousand points of light, which is the conservative version of we don't need a social safety net because people will take care of themselves through charity. We've had in the last year several books on inequality. One specifically on technology, the other probably one that people have heard more about and can't stop talking about that says it's not about technology at all, it's fundamental to capital. But the fundamental problem is everybody agrees that there's massively growing inequality, and then you come up with things like this, right? You look at poverty as it relates to the adoption of Social Security in the United States and old age poverty, and there is simply no question that Social Security or the adoption of a state-based transfer and security system was critical. Now, I'm standing here in the Netherlands saying this. This is so obvious, it's, not, it's ridiculous. But in the US, trust me, it's not, oddly enough. Um, but the challenge is not. Uh, cross-cultural. The challenge is to us and the culture of those who think that mutualism is a central uh, attribute and, war and are concerned about the state, how do we adopt the state into our models, recognizing its limitations? So politics is one of the classic things. We all have known sort of bloggers, the rise of bloggers, left and right, um, uh, and the importance of new voices, et cetera. We, there are long-standing arguments over the last 10 years uh, over this. There are studies that basically show that, as it turns out, for example, a study that I did with Aaron Shaw showing that left and right are different from each other. There are studies that suggest that organization, uh, it's not that it doesn't work. But what I want to capture for you is just the difference between the way it was used in campaigns. So if you look at 2004, there's an article uh, I particularly like because it's called Dean's Penguin, um, uh, about the way in which um, the st strategies of collaborative production from the net were brought to create out of, any, out of nothing an insurgent uh, uh, democratic campaign for Howard Dean. Then you had the maturation in 2008 of MyBarackObama.com and essentially the middle point where you have some leadership from the uh, uh, party but mostly people self-organizing in their own social networks. By the time you get to 2012, the adoration of Obama is about micro-targeting and, and about A, B testing and experimentation. The technology is no longer one of empowering individuals to create a candidate like it was in 2004. It's no longer one that's about allowing uh, candidates and communities to co-create each other. It's about allowing candidates to market themselves at the individual level through testing that manipulates what will make you open your purse and you go to your uh, uh, poll. And when Facebook does a similar experiment and shows that it can raise or lower uh, 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 the turnout of voters based on their newsfeed on election day, the loop is closed between what the public is doing with micro-targeting and managing uh, human behavior and what the market is doing. So again, it's not that it's impossible. Um, <coughs> we have uh, a study that, that one of our groups uh, uh, in Media Cloud uh, did of the Sopa Piba debate, looked at 18 months worth of, of all of the stories that raised Sopa Pippa in that massive debate that began as an perfectly reasonable piece of legislation. All of the reporting was, hey, nothing to see here. Industry is all for it. Democrats and Republicans are coming together. This thing will pass. 
And 18 months later, ended up with Wikipedia shutting down and everybody running again. And as you look at this period, you see exactly what the network public sphere should be. You see individual professors rising up and suddenly becoming the expert on something. You see NGOs working. You see left and right crossing over uh, and talking to each other. You see all of these um, uh, uh, components. You see experts coming, attesting to what this bill will do or that bill will do. You see. 30-some special purpose sites growing up. You see users on Reddit boycotting uh, uh, GoDaddy in order to prevent it from supporting the regulation. Within days, within hours, changing the entire way that industry was split on the legislation uh, through collective action. It is all possible. Then we saw a week and a half later the demonstrations against ACTA, and that was shut down here as well. The image of Polish legislatures pretending to be uh, 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 anonymous captures the wave of the moment. It's not impossible. It's deeply embedded in internet culture, even though it's politics uh, in general. And that was the moment at which, with the Arab Spring, we saw, oh, people were talking Facebook revolution, Twitter revolution uh, enabled. And we saw that move. We see, as we, if you look at, at some images from Gezi Park, again, the crossover from the Linux Penguin uh, to Anonymous, the crossover of the uh, ideology of freedom and resistance in the net translated into freedom and resistance in society. But then we know the reality. Then we know the reality. Things are not perfect. And it doesn't all have to be this dramatic. In a little study we did on um, um, uh, propositions in California that did the same thing that we did for Sopa Pippa for the 10 propositions in California, what you see is that of all the 10 propositions, only one the one that was in order to label GMO products actually had something like a network public sphere. Everything else has almost no linking, if you look up there to campaign sites and digital media, almost nothing. Those passed. The GMOs did not. Money won. It's not that easy. It's not that easy to replicate, but it's one affordance. And then we get, of course, to um, um, uh, uh, the NSA, and the House did pass a landmark amendment on one particular thing that's not insignificant. And the same people who were in the coalition to stop Sopa Pippa were always thinking about what to do around this. There was elements of the same coalitions, both against Sopa Pippa and copyright and against NSA wireless. There was the same um, 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 ambition to accept or, or acceptance of radical resistance in the, uh, uh, in the respect for Snowden and what he did. But part of what's interesting is that ultimately what happened on June 5th when the campaign launched, it was not about changing law. It was about changing the tools people apply. Reset the net was about, here, share the privacy pack. Not about law, not about legality, but about self-defense. If you want to be good about it, you say, this is Mutualism, this is self-protection, this is self-provisioning. If you want to be worried about it, this is the right to bear arms and, and the ability to protect yourself from the government rather than using legality. But there's a reason. There's a reason that we're so worried about legality because one of the major, at least wounded, injured of this event is legality itself as a modality of freedom. What we saw in the NSA story was a new pattern of subversion of private dominant platforms to increase social control. This is what we already saw in Facebook doing on the private side and the Obama campaign doing in the campaign side in the, uh, uh, in the uh, uh, surveillance side. But what's interesting is here is that when President Obama's initial response was, what do you want from me? There are courts looking at this. There's a legislative committee doing this. We have internal processes. The Justice Department is looking at this. This is what you want from a liberal state under the rule of law. There are legal mechanisms to control this. What more do you want? We need security. We've been in this story before. The current law is based on um, um, reforms done in the 70s because of massive uh, uh, public reaction against surveillance uh, and abuses by the FBI, CIA, and NSA in the 70s. Uh, as you read the front page of that report, history repeats itself almost without changing. Too much collection, not enough process, too much abuse potentially for uh, uh, political purposes. The model of freedom through legality requires improved processes, more complex internal controls, judicial review, delegated oversight. It assumes both factually that it's possible 
to build an internally contained system that is secret from the outside and functioning from the inside, and normative that the way to contain the power of the state is through legality, not through uh, self-action. Um, but in fact, what we saw instead was a series of acts that created oversight theater or legality theater, but used security protocols and secrecy to insulate each of the components of the three branches of government from its core source of power in public legitimacy. So what you saw is, first of all, use of things that didn't even count as surveillance, which were absolutely critical. The NSA goes in and actually changes, uh, uh, works to change basic technical protocols in order, to, uh, uh, in order to make surveillance easier. That's not even spying. It's not under the law. Then you get massive use of international. This is Axel's new, uh, new paper. Um, uh, massive use of, of uh, um, um, international spying capabilities layered on top of a, uh, an architecture that ignores international boundaries to actually capture massive amounts of data under a component that's not under oversight at all because it's under an executive order that's purely for foreign surveillance. You see internal legal decisions that then aren't reported to the court. You see uh, cooperation by the major telecommunications providers on things that are very flimsy, kind of, sort of, kind of look like law but aren't really. And then the inspector general five years later, six years later, says these were not uh, uh, legitimate. When you read the five inspectors general of the security branches approaches, uh, they say what they did here in the Justice Department was they used security clearance to basically find the individuals they wanted to look at it for the first two or three years and make them the only ones with clearance to see the, the subject. Then they went to the DOJ and say, bless this. But all the internal peer review and processes inside the Department of Justice were hacked by the fact that only the person who was already in their pockets was allowed to see this. Same thing happened with, uh, uh, the, with the, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act. Only one judge was allowed to see with not enough data. You see redundancy. Lots of, for some of these things, you get three or four different sources of authority, three or four different technical uh, mechanisms, so that even if you solve right, everything, all the battles now over the law will affect a subset of the pathways. It will not actually solve the problem fundamentally. Um, you see lots of internal processes I love the fact that last week, uh, uh, the, in a different context, the Chief, of, uh, the Chief Justice of the U.S. Supreme Court wrote, uh, the government pr proposes that law enforcement agencies develop protocols to address concerns raised by cloud computing. Probably a good idea, but the founders did not fight a revolution to get the, to get the right to government agency protocols. There's a fundamental skepticism. And in the NSA story, the skepticism is justified. Decision over decision, these were secret decisions that were leaked by Snowden or released by the government to show we actually do some process here without recognizing how clear they were. Where the judges basically pre pre are presented and saying, for three years you've been lying to me, or in a different opinion, um, I have to look at this all over again, or in a different position, this is the third time in three years you're lying to me, I have to conclude you've never actually complied with these procedures that I've permitted to you. And then you've got members of Congress basically saying that the whole congressional oversight is a sham because they're only allowed to go into a room without their aides, without any writing materials, and without any context, and they can't really do it. So what we have is theater of legality, not its reality, and a fundamental loss of belief in the possibility. So the problem of bulk surveillance is so difficult that the NSA, the Office of Director of National Intelligence, the FBI, the CIA, needed to rewire all of these things, open technical systems. Each one of these is part of the story. Professional norms-based standard setting, commercial product design, market responsiveness of firms, judicial mechanisms for protecting citizens and resident uh, privacy, executive branch internal checks, congressional formal oversight, and public accountability through public debate. Each and every one of these needed to be subverted in order for the practices that created such outrage when they came out to exist under the cover of legitimacy. Skepticism on one hand, on the other hand, through reverse engineering, a really cool beginning of a map for what it is that we need to build in resistance. If you imagine us basically living in multiple subsystems, Nicholas Luhmann's subsystems idea is the closest, but there are enough differences that it doesn't matter at the moment. Not just the classic Weberian state civil society market, but multiple more coherent systems that each of them exert a different power. Essentially what the NSA did was break 
the possibility of multiple different systems and create a single system uh, overbearing it all, dealing with what Helen Nissenbaum has called con contextual integrity, what Julie Cohen was trying to talk about with regard to uh, semantic discontinuity, the idea that what you have is a need for distinct spheres of action that are sufficiently distinct to avoid total control. That's what allows you to control. And that begins to create the framework for paths of resistance or degrees of freedom. So human beings are in systems everywhere. Routinized interactions among organizations, institutions, object processes, technical platforms, conceptual frameworks. They frame our beliefs about cause and effect, and in particular, the relationship of action to outcome. Systems are what provide us affordances and constraints. These regularities that lead human agents to understand that an action is within a system is either feasible or infeasible, and that allows them to act. It's a precondition to planning, and a precondition to planning is a precondition to autonomy. If we want and care, and the core value is about a capacity to plan and execute a life plan, um, uh, then it's a question of how free are we based on these uh, systems. And formal legal li liberties are part of, but can't be all the story. No freedom without systems. Liberal legality does offer answers, but they're partial. Libertarianism and, an uh, and, uh, and anarchism are incomplete. We need all of these things, whether they create market, whether they create justice, whether they're ancient and assure food, whether they're contemporary and assure health, whether they are based in markets or whether uh, not. They all come with their own well-known limitations. None of them are perfect. They all shape and misshape human experience in different ways. But that's all we have. We don't have anything other than the systems that we do. No system sufficiently complex and open to provide freedom to plan and execute a life for as diverse and complex a creature as human beings for whom learning, intentional change, and serendipity are core attributes, scaled to millions, can be perfect. Human systems are imperfect everywhere. Perfecting systems requires constraining choice, simplifying, regularizing interactions, but preserving freedom requires embracing imperfection, incompleteness, and diversity. Freedom then becomes freedom to bob and weave between different systems of constraint and affordances, different expectations of failure, different modes of failure, and continuously updating and trying to go between these systems and harness them as we move uh, forward. Legality and prescribed processes will necessarily run out under such complex and changing uh, uh, conditions. The claim of competeness and the ambition to limit responses to prescribed or within system actions is authoritarian at its core. Freedom as practical navigation within and between systems also means that there's no escape to value neutrality and process. Both within system and prescribed between system mechanisms are part but only part of the solution. Conscience is absolutely necessary. So many years ago, Jamie Boyle invoked us to go with an environmentalism for the net. And in it, he imagined a political alliance that turned out 10 years later to have been exactly the one political alliance that emerged. But there's another lesson from that uh, environmentalism. It's the persistent of the problem, its changing nature, its complexity, and the fact that we are never going to be done. It's a struggle, it's not a lifelong struggle, it's a many generations struggle. It changes. Yesterday's allies are tomorrow's villains, and vice versa. We need continuous updating based on core beliefs, in this case, of freedom, not a set of patterns that we already know. We can provision alternative systems. We can increase openness and loot bindings in existing systems that can't be displaced. We can leverage affordances. It doesn't matter where specifically. So Marvin Amori can write about the specific generation of in-house counsel of entrepreneurial firms that have been trying to constrain. It doesn't matter wherever you are, particularly in some sense for the lawyers, the young lawyers in the room, wherever you are, you tweak, you push. You do something knowing where you want to go and understanding the context. And the solution in the US will not be the solution in the Netherlands because the cultures are so different, because people here ride bikes with kids in the front with no helmets, and it's fabulous. Law where relevant in whatever form makes other systems make them open. You have to be strategic. You have to be systemic. You have to be aware of the limitations in the context. You can't just assume one law is easily translatable or generalizable. So to conclude, there is no single system to preserve freedom. 
No fixed model or ideal guarantee of freedom, not the market and the free market, not civil rights, not constitutional democracy. Each of these is not an abstract idea. It's an actually instantiated system with persistent and diverse imperfections that vary by context. Incompleteness, imperfection, continual practical updating and adaptation are a central feature of how we are to be free under conditions of complex modern societies, typified by uncertainty, unintended effects, and change. Individual conscious, therefore, must play a critical constructive role. Perturbing systems, trenchant criticism are germane to the process of learning and improvement in persistently imperfect system. You cannot just rely on the system. So let me finish with a, um, um, uh, a poem which translated to Hebrew was something that growing up in Israel, we all uh, read and had to read in high school. But because Brecht had decided to move to East Germany after the war, was not translated into English until the late 90s, because uh, anything can be read by anyone. General, your tank is a powerful vehicle. It smashes down forests and uh, crushes 100 men, but it has one defect. It needs a driver. General, your bomber is powerful. It is, flies faster than a storm and carries more than an elephant, but it has one defect. It needs a mechanic. General, man is very useful. He can fly and he can kill, but he has one defect. He can think. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Benkler and Yochai. That was fantastic. More than enough uh, food for thought for several conferences in several disciplines. And I think uh, implicitly you are conveying the message that information law crosses disciplines. Um, thank you so much. Our next speaker just arrived. Our very special guest speaker needs no introduction. This is a cliche and always follows an introduction. Um, but certainly in this country, where she originates from and has become very popular, um, she doesn't need that introduction. Ms. Nelly Cruz is, and here's the introduction, <laughs> European Commissioner for the Digital Agenda, as we all know, and Vice President of the European Commission. She has, in the past five years, initiated policies for the internet, for new media services, for telecommunications, privacy, open data, e-health, and lots of other things. And her speech today is about an area of special concern, as its title, its rather urgent title, reveals the single market is crying out for copyright reform. Ms. Coase, uh, the University of Amsterdam, and EFIA, the Institute for Information Law, are extremely honored by your presence here today, and I invite you to the floor. Good evening, everybody. Um, I'm not certain that it's all pleasure that I want to touch upon this afternoon, but let me start with just saying happy birthday to you and to everybody at the Institute of Information Law. And normally spoken when I'm just mentioning that, I'm singing and I would sing happy birthday. But technically, I think the song is still under copyright. And I don't want to have to pay the royalty, so to say. Today, the debate about information, about innovation and intellectual property can be complex, can be personal, and can be heated. Our duty as lawmakers is to find a balance between creators and the justified interests of society. And that balance is changing. Transforming technology is changing how people use and how they reuse information. 
and disrupting a long-standing legal framework. Already today, ladies and gentlemen, that framework seems dated, if not irrelevant, to put it in a nice way. Every day that passes, it becomes more so. To debate these issues objectively, we need a forum, both solid and open-minded, without political constraints or vested interest. So I welcome, especially the Institute for Information Law, that you are continuing to tackle those issues. We badly need you. You should just wake us up. And I thank you for all you have done already, many studies in many areas of the digital economy. And I sincerely hope that your input on copyright too will play an important role, for it is a worthwhile input. And I start from principles, not too bad in this building with a lot of history. What should a sound EU copyright system do? A valid question. Number one, it needs to promote creativity and innovation, to encourage and to stimulate innovative new works, new opportunities, new channels, and new models, to enable the research that leads to, at the end of the day, new discoveries. And second, it must remunerate and reward creators. And that's not just about fairness. We expect creators to invest their time and their talent. And of course, reward, recognition, remuneration are essential. Without remuneration, the creative tap would fast stop flowing and then we are just pulling our own legs, so to say. And I've always believed that. But the current copyright system does not do it well. Not nearly well enough, to put it again, diplomatic. Many creators scrim by on a pittance, unable to find their full audience, unable to share or to sell their words as widely or creatively as they want. Limitations and obstructions do nothing for creativity. Take that line home. So if we could agree on that, limitations and obstructions do nothing for creativity. And third, it should enable a digital single market, removing the barriers that get between artists and their audience, that prevent innovation, that shatter economies of scale. And the EU leaders, by the way, are signed up to a full, vibrant digital single market. And they are repeating that every council again. So is president-designate Juncker. Now they need to act on their ambitions. Copyright is a major essential part of that. And last, perhaps most importantly, the legal framework needs to take account of the needs of society. Users' interests and users' expectations matter alongside creators' rights. It's not one, it is both. Rules cannot be impractical, cannot be uncertain, cannot be unreasonable for ordinary users. How do you find that balance? Not an easy one, no doubt about that. So clearly changes with technology and over time. And today's world is a very different one compared to that of the 2001 EU Copyright Directive. It's not that long ago, that's the point, but the world has been changed completely. With new expectations for consumers, new opportunities for creators, new tools from social media to big data. And everyday citizens here in the Netherlands and across the EU break the law just to do something, to do something commonplace. And who can blame them when those laws are so ill-adapted? Every day, startups, small businesses, scientists abandon innovative ideas. Why? because the legal fees are too great. Every day, 
people bypass the copyright system using alternatives like open source, something which can lead to huge creativity, to huge innovation, and to huge richness. Copyright risks become an irrelevant. And the internet gives enormous opportunities for artists and for consumers. More direct access to a wider audience and a wider range of content. So absolutely great. New ways to share, to spread, to sell. New ways to reward and recognize. New ways for audiences to appreciate getting what they want when they want it. A good copyright system would help us achieve that. Today, no one. Today, it's not working. Some examples. When uncertainty prevents people remixing or creating their own content, how does that boost creativity? When teachers are afraid, and not only in the Netherlands, by the way, to share teaching materials online. How does that help our society? And when a European video on demand provider tries to expand the new markets, but gives up because clearing copyright is so catastrophically cumbersome, how does that benefit our economy? And when consumers want to buy films or TV shows online, but find they are geo-blocked, how does that benefit the fight against piracy? How does it benefit the artists whose works they could be watching? When lovers of old films, for example, have to physically fly to a different country to see them, even if they are no longer in commercial uh, circulation, how does that support European culture? When museums have to take out insurance specifically against the risk of copyright lawsuits because it's too complex and costly to figure out how does that help promote European heritage? And when you can't sing happy birthday or post a picture of the atomium, how is that fair or reasonable? How is that something you can explain to ordinary citizens? And I'm always mentioning, I need to explain it also to my neighbor, for otherwise I'm failing. When European scientists have to abandon text or data mining because they can't afford the legal fees, how does that help innovation and scientific progress? And by the way, that restriction is costing our economy tens of billions of euros. I really see no real winners any, in any of those cases. Creators lose out, innovators lose out, users lose out, our economy lose out. The system serves no one and solve those problems. And I see only winners. All those examples, if you just turn it the other side, then we are all winners. We just have to jump over our own shadow. Technology moves faster than the law can, particularly in the EU. Today, the EU copyright framework is fragmented, is inflexible, and is often irrelevant. And it should be a stimulant to openness and to innovation and creativity, not a tool for obstruction or limitation or control. How do you explain this to the man on the street? How do you explain it to your neighbor? That is something I've really struggled with in this term as commissioner, and in my previous term as a commissioner for competition policy too. Things need to change in Europe, and they need to change right now. And it's obvious, as other parts of the world have already seen. In 2009, very nice example, Japan introduced a copyright exception, covering text and data mining, including for commercial use. They saw the light, so to say. In Canada, in 2012, they added an exception for non-commercial user-generated content. And in none of those places 
has the sky fallen in. All of those places are now innovating, are creating, are progressing, while the EU lumbers by with an aging system for an analog age. Sometimes it is indeed hard to find the middle ground between different principles to fairly balance different interests. Not in this case, ladies and gentlemen. The solution is already starting us in the face. It doesn't even have to be about principles. It's about allying with current practices with what most people are already doing. Those opportunities should not just be available to those who can afford expensive lawyers or are prepared to ignore the law altogether. They should be for everyone. And at the least, at the very least, that is what the law can do. Follow current practices. At a minimum, here in the EU, we have done preparatory work, we have done dialogues, we have done public consultations, we have done legal and economic studies, we have endless assessed, examined, analyzed, and please, now it's time to act. It's time to show that Europe can deal with those issues for people care about. With the, with the possible exception of roaming charges, our copyright rules are perhaps the greatest example, the one that most frustrates ordinary citizens. The thing you just can't explain. They are highly visible. They are highly irritating, seen by almost all as an anachronism. It's time to show Europe is capable of dealing with that frustration. Time to show Europe can be relevant, Europe can be responsive, and Europe can be reform-minded. And what does that pragmatic reform mean? It means more possibilities to access content online cross-border. It means more harmonized exceptions, benefiting researchers, benefiting teachers, benefiting cultural heritage, and benefiting user-producers. It indeed means flexibility. So we don't have to have the same discussion every five years. Yesterday, the Commission agreed a way forward to enforce intellectual property, and that proposal included copyright. We agreed that focusing on ordinary users would be heavy-handed, would be disproportionate, and would be ineffective. We agreed that new powers were not the answer either. Instead, we will pursue non-legislative measures under existing powers focused on a large-scale commercial infringement. And in my opinion, that's the right way forward. But even that way, to, and that approach to enforcement, cannot stand alone. And that was my big point yesterday. It must be accompanied by wider and significant reform. It would be highly regrettable if the current Commission could not achieve that. But now we are also turning to a new mandate and a new generation. We have EU leaders and lawmakers committed to copyright modernization. We have a commission president designate fully signed up to a digital single market, but it's not enough to preach. You should deliver, and that is what is at stake. And dear uh, friends, I'm using this opportunity to just rock the boat and say it can't be that we are only fighting the crime but we have to find out where the source of the crime has to be defeated. So the digital single market badly needs copyright reform, and the essential centerpiece is the copyright reform. Otherwise, it wouldn't be credible. It would just be words, and we are often blamed that it is more words than delivery. So I sincerely hope that work will continue seriously and that it will go fast. And I hope that the Institution for Information Law is fully involved in that debate, 
Time is not our friend. We have to deliver. And normal citizens are expecting that we can indeed tackle this problem. Thank you. Thank you uh, so much for uh, rocking this boat and for coming to Amsterdam, as I already said. You, were, you have generously uh, offered some more of your uh, time to uh, answer a few questions before you go back to Brussels, I guess. Um, any questions? See a question over there. Does it work? Excuse me. Uh, yes. Good evening. My name is Lucie Guibault. I was recently a member of the expert group on standardization. Uh, oops. <laughs> Sorry. Um, <laughs> Um, in the, for innovation and technological development, and especially for text and data mining, that was set up by DG Research um, and Innovation recently. Um, you mentioned text and data mining in your speech, and I find it very interesting. Um, you are, of course, aware that the situation in Europe is not as, uh, uh, well, good, let's say, as in the United States regarding to, uh, scientific publications and scientific uh, text and data mining. Unfortunately, the echoes that are coming currently uh, from Brussels uh, do not seem to indicate that there will be a, a very big change in the copyright and database law framework. And um, I was just wondering, well, how can we rock the boat more to in, uh, really ensure that um, not only institutionalized research that does uh, research for non-commercial pur pur purposes, but also research carried out by SMEs and uh, other commercial entities that do very valuable research, how can we rock the boat further to make sure that the copyright uh, reform takes place? Thank you. Thank you very much for the question. For I imagine that some of you are thinking, my goodness, she is pleading for something that she is responsible for. So who is doing what in the, the different way? Um, of course, I'm a member of the commission, no doubt about that. Uh, I'm collegial, or I try to be collegial. But to be quite open to you, after four and a half years, I'm fed up and not fed, up, not fed up because I didn't get what I was asking for, but because I can't explain if you are talking about a digital market. And if you are talking about, and no misunderstanding, I'm very much in favor for decent remunerations for artists, creators, writers, researchers, name them. But we have to take into account that what was at stake a couple of years ago is not anymore at stake. It's a complete different world. And it can be win-win. Well, after four and a half years, um, I'm aware that within a couple of weeks, we, the Commission, will come with a white paper or what color of paper. I'm not interested in it. But anyhow, that it is not the content that we badly need. And I'm not saying that it should be per se the way we within my uh, director general are thinking of copyright. But anyhow, that you can explain that it is solving a problem. And rightly said by you, what is at stake? If we are talking about text and data mining in scientific publications, come on. What are we blocking if we are not solving this problem? And what could we open for opportunities? And what could we just push? And there are tremendous great examples also on the other side of the ocean where we can prove that it makes sense to open that type of issue. So for scientific research, but also for the development of the new digital services, it is extremely important that we are just 
bringing it open. And of course, there are a couple of other issues that we should also tackle, but that's still not the case. So what I'm asking you in your publications, in your statements, in your speeches and your discussions, please explain that normal life is suffering when we are not dealing with it. And that is, of course, now at stake with a new commission to be. And it depends very much where copyright is in what portfolio, with what nationality of a commissioner, for I can assure you that makes quite a bit of sense. And at the end of the day, I'm also a big behavior that it could be very, very important for solving this problem for France too. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, second question, I saw a hand. Yeah, your neighbor raised a hand. Well, um, thank you for giving me the opportunity to ask a question. Um, Michael Zemfler, Professor of Intellectual Property at the Free University here in Amsterdam. Um, I think we, we all see quite clearly that copyright has an image problem at the moment. And when the decision you have taken at the European level is that it would not be enforced against ordinary users in their private homes, then this also reflects the problem that we have, this problem of social legitimacy. We might have the laws in place, but we don't have the social legit legitimacy, the acceptance in society that we need to also tell ordinary people that they have to obey the law. So where do we get this from? I think you gave one of the answers. You can ensure that the system really works, really does something for the individual author. So if we get a wonderful new framework, a wonderful new EU framework for more innovation, more creativity, more business models, then how do we ensure with all this that at the end of the day, in the pockets of the individual, individual creator, there will be more money than before? And you may know that the Dutch legislator is uh, taking steps in this direction at the moment. In Germany, very steps. Very small ones. Very small ones. Well, okay. But Better steps. than them. So if, if these are small steps, what are the major steps mm. that we can expect at the European level? And um, how would you make sure that copyright law really remunerates the authors mm. and really gets the acceptance necessary to enforce it at the end of the day in a broader yeah. range? Thank you. I imagine, Professor, that we are agreeing that we are on the same page when we are saying copyright needs to go with, with its time. For it, it should be uh, aware that it's not anymore the last century. Having said that, and you are asking for what is the solution? How can we just get a balance in those two uh, parties, so to say? In, in any event, in my opinion, an efficient and transparent digital single market is the first condition, for otherwise you will never be successful. And then you can put authors, you can put the performers in a position to negotiate, and to negotiate with the publishers and the producers, or even to try to marketing far more than what is at stake now, new ways of uh, getting a position. So for me, it is furthermore getting the balance and positions. It's not only about the authors and about the creators, it is also about the interests of society. And I'm absolutely determined to, to defend that the average citizen is not interested in illegal dealing with this type of issues, but there should be a transparent and a very effective way of dealing with it. And then the technology can help at the moment. And that is what is at stake where we have to make a step forward. And there are countries that are, and the Netherlands, the UK, not yet the big step forwards, but anyhow, a movement in the right direction and Europe should do the same. And uh, I'm pushing and therefore I need your help to push the next commission to really solve the problem for doing nothing is going backwards instead of going forward. Okay, we have uh, time for one more question and I'm being very undemocratic about that. I will pose that question myself. <laughs> I'm very sorry, no open access here. <laughs> Vice President uh, Cruz, you've been arguing forcefully over the past couple of years for EU copyright reform almost from the day that you were given primary responsibility over Europe's uh, digital agenda, maybe even before. 
but it was refused when I was asked put copyright in it too. For there were lobbyists who were against that I would deal with it. I know, I know. It's a, it's a, it's a great pity. Mm. However, um, despite the fact that, that many in Europe, including me and many in this room, maybe not everyone, agree with you that something needs to be done, something needs to be done urgently, uh, real reform still seems to be beyond the horizon. Although I must admit I haven't seen what you decided yesterday with your colleagues. Um, why is copyright reform in the EU so difficult? Professor, you were touching upon different cultures between the United States of America and, uh, and, and Europe, and you were taking as example the bikers with their kids. I can assure you that you don't need to jump over the ocean. It is already within Europe that there are different cultures, and by the way, I'm attracted to those different cultures for, I think, and I'm proud to be a European with so many cultures, but we should be uh, absolutely aware that there is one crown jewel in this European family, and that is the internal market. That is a single internal market. And a single internal market, why a crown jewel? No borders, no barriers, and not yet finalized, no doubt about that, but it's giving big opportunities. And every citizen nowadays is already living in that type of uh, accommodation, so to say. They are interested in uh, going across uh, the former border. They are interested in all types of cultures and having and so on and so forth. I shouldn't talk too long. But you can't neglect that if you are talking about a single market, then you shouldn't stop for copyright. You shouldn't stop for just making it then in ring fan systems. And then, if we are not solving this problem, other ones are making money out of it, but not in the right way, so to say. So therefore, I'm absolutely a strong believer that we need to avoid fragmentation. That is the advantage of being a member of the European family, and that makes a lot of sense also for creators and also for all those who are linked with uh, the copyright and the remuneration. Also researchers, and in this house I'm certain that giving the text and data mining more opportunities. Come on, then you are talking about huge step forward also in our research and innovation. I think our time uh, is up. Certainly your time is up. Thank you uh, again so much for coming uh, to Amsterdam and sharing your thoughts on EU copyright reform. Uh, we will uh, Could you give you. That, that gentleman the, the opportunity for a question? For otherwise I have anyhow, yeah, no, you. Yeah, you. Yeah, you were asking for the floor, if it's allowed. Oh, right? well, uh, I hate to have... We're, we're, uh, we have all the time in the world, we're academics. Yeah. Um, <laughs> You were asking for the floor, weren't you? Or you were just waving? <laughs> that is my habit, to just wave. Um, so, so um, thank you uh, for your speech. I'm Hans Zwart, Director of Bits of Freedom, a Dutch digital rights organization. And my question is a little bit inspired, I think, by Professor Bankler's speech. And it is maybe something that is a little bit more inside your domain. Um, so, so what we're seeing is that big telcos are creating exclusive deals with companies like Deezer and Spotify um, in so-called free packages uh, using discriminatory pricing. Um, my question is how will independent artists be able to get into the market if such discrimination is not prohibited by the telecom single market regulation? It is one of the opportunities, but it is not limited to those opportunities. So the market will give other opportunities, and I can assure you that uh, very innovative people will take also the opportunity to get their bit in this type of the music world, for, for example, or in other fields. And I'm impressed, if you allow me to say so, and I just visited one of those great initiatives, Dutch origin, but now a global one, 
they are finding everywhere when there is no limitation, and that is with your deal, some telcos are making those deals, but at the end of the day, the Skype uh, boys, and I don't think there were girls at, at that time, yeah, there were girls, but not involved in that uh, project, uh, that they were uh, just dealing with only a couple. No way. They did it themselves, and there is every time new initiatives. Okay. Um, any more questions? Yeah. <laughs> Shall we get to yeah. one really, yeah. really final question? Thank you, Ms. Cruz, for this opportunity. Thank you, Dr. Hugenholz, for allowing this. Um, one thing with the uh, culture uh, which we all share which, uh, is that it is not dominated actually by creators but by publishers. The publishers were uh, uh, conspicuously absent from uh, your very fine speech but I do wonder what will be in it for them. Are we going to take their rights away? Are we going to make automatic licenses? What, what is, because essentially we have copyright to make sure that the public domain will eventually evolve of it. So, because culture is made by what we share with each other. What will be the incentive for those holding all the things we are currently sharing from the last 100 years to take part in this initiative, which I really would love to see? That's a great initiative of you to give uh, the gentleman, the floor, for him. and I wasn't aware, we don't know each other, not as far as I'm uh, aware of. What we share with each other, and that at the end of the day, is the start of culture, and that is indeed very, very important. And what my point is, and what is uh, just involving my actions in, in this field, that in the meantime, the technology has been changing so much and has given us and a lot of people so much more opportunities. So we are not only talking about the happy few from day one on involved in culture and in creation and, and so on. We all have to change our mindset. We all have really to put on different uh, buttons, so to say, also the publishers. And what in the in, in the, the last couple of years with quite a number of uh, discussions also with publishers but also with collective societies. My goodness, if you are a barrier for developing, dealing with share and sharing with the culture, then I think you are not up to date. And now I'm putting it in a very diplomatic way and normally spoken when they are coming over for coffee. I'm less diplomatic for a professor. I have to apologize, but I'm Dutch. I'm, I'm blunt and straightforward and not a diplomat and so on. But that is, that is the point. If we are still trying to put it in a climate in which we were used to, and rightly so, for the circumstances were like that, now it is completely different. And everyone, nearby every citizen, has the opportunity themselves to make their own part of culture and their own piece of adding to something. And that is what I am absolutely not able to explain, not only to them, but also to others, that if that is blocked, if I'm, if I'm not allowed to make a clip for just pushing coding for girls, with a bit of music, and my people were saying, you can't do that, for there is copyright on that. Well, we don't have a budget to pay copyright for that, but can you imagine my clip, and I can assure you, it was not a clip that would be downloaded by millions and millions, so, um, but still. So, I, I completely agree with your point, what we share with each other, that indeed is, our richdom, and we should just take care of that, but taking care of what is possible at the moment in the whole technology development. Okay, that's really the final question and answer. Uh, thank you again, uh, Commissioner Cruz, for uh, joining us in our birthday party and for rocking the boat of copyright. Um,
We're almost done, but not quite. One more event, and then we're done. Uh, the Information Influx Young Scholars Program is the result of a call for papers addressed to uh, young scholars worldwide, active in the vast field of information law. From 65 abstracts, 15 were chosen to write a paper. And from these 15, five young and very talented young scholars are competing to receive the prize awarded tonight. And these names now should appear on a slide. <laughs> that magic works. The prize, a 1,000 euro book voucher sponsored by a publisher, Voltos Kluwer, <laughs> will now be awarded by our keynote speaker, Professor Benkler, to the author of a wonderful paper on a highly topical and controversial subject already touched upon earlier this afternoon. The candidate has shown a tremendous capacity to dig deep into the issue and provide answers based on empirical and comparative methods of analysis. The results are as nuanced as they are useful for policymakers and civil activists. Professor Benkler, may I invite you to hand out the award? Here comes the Oscar moment. He's not joking about the Oscar moment. They actually have an envelope. <laughs> wow, you're in trouble and you need me to open an envelope. Um, and the winner is Harry Halperin of the W3C MIT. Okay, so, so actually, I, I, Use the microphone. I have a question for Nellie Cruz. <laughs> so, so I'm going to use this microphone as a chance to ask it. So thank you very much. Um, I work for the W3C MIT. I'm in the French office right now. And um, you know, I do cryptography, and the paper was on cryptography and data secrets and European laws around that, which are actually you know, much better than uh, Europe. You don't have secret courts and many other things that we unfortunately have in the United States. Um, in my job, I also authored the response to the copyright consultation, which had so many responses that I have no idea whose job was to, to read them, but I'm sure it was quite complicated. And we stood up for something we think essential to the web, is something called the right to link. So that linking to any data anywhere in the world on a website should effectively be legal. So this means this has wide repercussions. Linking to things like, for example, um, Pirate Bay, um, leaking to BitTorrents or even linking to documents on WikiLeaks would, we should think, be legal itself, even if there's perhaps some content problems that may make the content illegal. And I was wondering, and I noticed in your speech you did not mention um, the right to link. And I have a second question. I'm gonna, and the, 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 the second question is simply, do you think that digital rights management based on hardware should be made illegal in Europe? Sorry for the overtime. I apologize. No, 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 no. Everything that is mentioned and that could help to uh, get a better position for Europe is welcome. Um, it is possible, by the way, and there are court cases, so we still have to wait till the outcome is clear because it should be legally uh, indeed 100% uh, clear, but it is already possible. My people are saying that anyhow. I have one remark to be added for the, the right to link. Um, and I was just thinking the right to be forgotten. I'm very much in, in favor for the right to be forgotten, but if the consequence is that people are not thinking through before they are sending something, and that is what I'm linking with, the right to link, that we should just be very clear and transparent 
what is the link with what and where? Because the right to be forgotten, again, um, you can even say that is a, a great right, but if the consequences is that if I'm obliged to, uh, to take into account that your message to me needs to be forgotten because you are asking that, but if I have already forwarded it to someone else, you know, don't know what consequences is it. And for me, the main issue, and I am misusing your point, is that, no, 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 but that uh, people are thinking, and especially for youngsters, for children, that they can do whatever they want, for you can later on say, right to be forgotten, come on, and then you are not thinking through what the consequences are. Congratulations. <laughs> Congratulations indeed. It's good to congratulate someone else today as well. Um, the, we're done. This brings the opening uh, event to an end. Thank you so much for turning out in such large numbers to celebrate the, only the first part of our birthday party, of Evia's birthday party. And we much look forward to seeing many of you tomorrow and Friday at our conference. Thank you.